Well, as we seem to be uh, missing uh, one speaker who just a minute ago was, was here, uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, let me thank uh, all of you uh, for, for coming here. Uh, for uh, those uh, whom I have not had the privilege of meeting uh, yet, uh, my name is uh, Jacek Belica, and I am the Special Envoy for Nonproliferation and Disarmament at the European External Action Service here in uh, Brussels. I have been in this position for uh, almost seven years already, and previously I was for uh, four years in the position that this guy over there has at, at NATO, which means in practice that between the two of us, we have probably attended uh, most, if not all, of these conferences, uh, also similar ones organized uh, by uh, NATO uh, every year. Uh, Probably uh, none of these conferences were held in such an impressive room as this, at this, as this one. So I must congratulate uh, the organizers uh, from the consortium for uh, having um, uh, secured such a, such a room. But also, and this is probably a more important point, I don't think any of those uh, conferences have taken, uh, have taken place in such a challenging uh, moment. Uh, which uh, has been briefly described in the message from HRVP, but I think all of us following this portfolio are very much uh, aware of how difficult and challenging these times are uh, security-wise and what impact this has on the global <coughs> disarmament non-proliferation uh, regime. So indeed, this is an opportunity for us to brainstorm about this situation and for this, we have uh, assembled uh, a, a very high-level panel uh, for the opening. Uh, I am hoping that one prominent member of this panel is now coming back to the room. Yes, this is indeed the case, so I can uh, move into the substance. Um, me, myself, I will have the privilege of speaking about um, the EU's uh, policies and activities in the closing panel of this conference tomorrow. Uh, so how in practice we are implementing the call by the previous high representative and the new high representative in terms of EU's uh, policies and activities and what sort of tools we have at our disposal. This will be a subject of, uh, of the last panel of this conference. Uh, but in this panel uh, we uh, will have the privilege to hear from, uh, first of all, uh, the global organization, United Nations, uh, we are honored, honored to have with us uh, UN Undersecretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, uh, Mrs. Izumi Nakamitsu, who will uh, speak uh, first. Then we will move to the two um, major uh, nuclear uh, powers uh, with um, uh, Under Secretary of State uh, for International Security and Arms Control, Dr. Christopher Ford, and uh, Ambassador Mikhail Ulyanov, who currently is the Russian ambassador in Vienna to the UN uh, organizations in Vienna, including the International Atomic Energy Agency, but previously was the director of the relevant department in the Russian Foreign Ministry when it still had disarmament in its name. Uh, currently, it's the Arms Control and Non-Proliferation Department. Uh, and then uh, our um, neighbors here in Brussels, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, Director William Alberg, who is also uh, a renowned expert on arms control, disarmament, and proliferation. I call upon you to consult their impressive biographies in the, uh, in the uh, conference materials. Uh, but uh, in order to go directly into the substance, I would suggest that each of us, uh, each of you provides 10, 15 minutes of introductory remarks. Then we will uh, give the floor to the participants and then towards the end, there will be an opportunity to react <coughs> from all members of the panel. If this is agreeable, uh, Ms. Nakamitsu, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Jacek. Good morning to all of you. Um, I am terribly honored, and indeed I feel humbled, uh, to be amongst this uh, very distinguished panel. Um, and also, 
I think it's safe to say that I am, I am amongst friends uh, who all want to, in fact, discuss disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control issues precisely because we want to make sure that the world that we are living in uh, remains or, or continues to increase uh, the secure and more stable uh, environment. Uh, so what, what I would like to do um, in, in, the, in the time that is given to me is to touch on perhaps four things. Uh, first one is obviously our ass assessment analysis of the current environment, main developments and trends in disarmament and, and international security. Um, the second, of course, um, I will have to uh, touch on briefly on the forthcoming uh, MPT review conference. And then thirdly, um, the questions, thank you for the guiding questions. I think it all really sort of points us to new trends, uh, new developments. What are the things that we need to do in order to tackle those new developments? So I want to devote some time in that. And then the fourth, as a concluding part of my uh, remarks, um, multilateralism, uh, and of course, um, what we would like to expect from the European Union as well. So uh, let me just dive into those four uh, areas of uh, um, issues. Um, I have been quoting the Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, recently very often. He said that um, in the, at, at the, the most recent General Assembly, across the global landscape, we see conflicts persisting, terrorism spreading, and the risk of a new arms race growing. Um, I think this uh, sentiment, this analysis was echoed by many uh, of the representatives of UN member states. Um, what we see in the uh, current environment is perhaps four uh, major uh, trends. One obviously is that uh, the current geostrategic context is increasingly uh, defined by distrust, lack of or breakdown of dialogues, um, and uh, preference of member states, in fact, uh, over a show of military force rather than uh, diplomacy. Um, very worrying uh, uh, trends indeed. Um, relations amongst and between so-called uh, great powers uh, seem to be competition rather than cooperation, uh, and that obviously is impacting on uh, what we see in terms of uh, arms control and, and disarmament regime. Um, the second, uh, very much related to the first trend, second is the emergence of multipolar nuclear order, uh, regional nuclear challenges, including increased proliferation drivers, uh, the Middle East um, included, and proliferation of delivery vehicles, such as ballistic missiles, very concerning. And I am actually very happy to see that in this conference there are specific uh, breakout sessions devoted to region-specific uh, challenges. I think it is very uh, important that we actually deepen our understandings of those uh, uh, drivers of proliferation at different regions. Um, and all these is coupled with a modernization or qualitative nuclear arms race um, we often uh, refer to and um, dangerous rhetorics uh, about utility or potential utilities of nuclear weapons. I'm very worried about that. So with all these things combined, um, we see that potential use of nuclear weapons, whether that is intentional or, or through accident or miscalculation, is probably higher than it has been since the, the darkest days of the Cold War, that, that is the previous Cold War. Um, the challenges to non-proliferation, disarmament, and arms control regimes are, of course, uh, not occurring in isolation. It is also always a part of a broader security context and a political context. Um, and it is influenced, definitely, and exacerbated by other developments um, and, and dynamics uh, as well. Um, and here I am uh, I'm talking about not just uh, in the military and security spheres, but all the other major uh, um, international relations uh, uh, priorities are also feeding into this. So we need to look into all of those things and, and uh, look at disarmament and non-proliferation in a wider context of international relations. The third um, yeah, has been already uh, mentioned, uh, but new technologies, um, cyber, 
space, artificial intelligence, uh, UAVs, um, those new technologies uh, are uh, definitely um, uh, giving us new challenges. Of course, these things actually bring us enormous uh, benefits, but if these are misused, uh, they are going to pose uh, additional risks to our security. And some people even say that there are new domains of warfare um, and uh, actions are, are not easily uh, classifiable or fall below sort of traditional threats, uh, thresholds for armed attack or, um, um, or act of uh, aggression. So there are also new gray areas of discussions that we need to actually uh, uh, look into. Um, problems of um, uh, application of international law. From the United Nations, we always say that international law applies to all domains, all areas. Um, it's, it was never developed for specific areas, but international law has to, to apply to all of our, of our uh, conducts. Um, but there are uh, indeed uh, questions being asked whether there are gaps uh, in the existing international law or not. So those are the issues that we need to look into. More directly related to security, uh, they, they seem to be new vulnerabilities um, definitely in the security areas, hacking, spoofing, third parties with malicious intent, terrorist organizations, most importantly. So all of those things uh, are in fact uh, new challenges that we have to put our heads together and, and tackle um, in order to also make sure that um, the, the barriers to the use of nuclear weapons will not be lowered um, at a, a strategic level that will be probably the most important. Against this background, conflicts continue and, and, and they flare across the world and are becoming increasingly complex and protracted. The fourth, um, obviously, um, it's been mentioned in many different places, erosion of disarmament and non-proliferation uh, instruments, existing in instruments. Uh, many people, obviously, in, uh, in the European continent um, often refer to the INF Treaty, the demise of INF Treaty. But I also want to, to make sure that we all remember and then, uh, again, put our heads together, actions together, uh, to make sure that the violations of the agreed uh, uh, international law and norms uh, uh, against the, um, the, the chemical weapons, the CWC, uh, is tackled urgently. I very much agree with the references made um, to this effect. Accountability is uh, very important if we were to, in fact, uphold and restore the norm against chemical weapons. Um, uh, let me just ch touch one word. Uh, the Secretary General's agenda for disarmament uh, was put together against this background and, and, and concerns. And, and, and thank you. Uh, I, I need to thank the European Union. You now are uh, definitely the, the biggest supporter and champions uh, of various actions. Um, but uh, what I wanted to say is that the agenda was made, put together in such a way that it will support member states' actions and responsibilities in disarmament and non-proliferation. Now, a few words up, uh, on the NPT. Um, the stakes are very high. I think the challenges are very high as well. Uh, but I want to emphasize that it will be a very important opportunity for states' parties to make sure that the challenges can be countered. And in fact, the uh, important, very important cornerstone of this uh, uh, multilateral instrument is upheld and also uh, further strengthened. Um, I don't believe actually that failure to achieve a consensus big outcome document um, in 2020 would not necessarily signal the demise of the treaty. Um, so I think we need to make sure that um, you, or well, states parties, I should say, states parties of this uh, treaty will now urgently articulate what kind of an outcome you would like to achieve. And a common understanding of what outcome will in fact be a success in the current uh, um, environment will be quite important. And for that, uh, I think there are uh, very critical need for uh, um, a leadership. Uh, we will need uh, as quickly as possible the president to designate to be confirmed um, so that we can together start preparing very concretely 
uh, for the successful outcome of the NPT. Now, for us, there are four issues uh, very uh, critical for a positive approach in, the, in this uh, review cycle. One is reconfirming the commitment, uh, preferably at the very high level, political level, to this treaty. Two is a demonstration of implementation of obligations. Three, strengthening non-proliferation measures against emerging challenges, and I touched on some of those uh, already. And four, taking practical steps in nuclear disarmament. Whilst the, the challenges are very high, um, I still do believe that uh, there are many things that you can do uh, in terms of practical uh, uh, measures um, towards nuclear disarmament. Um, and um, moving on to my third point, which is a new approaches, a call for new vision, etc. I also add that MPT review conference in 2020, in fact, will be a very important launch pad uh, for states party to acknowledge and, and, and recognize that there are new challenges out there. Uh, and that can, in fact, be a, a first step towards uh, different uh, member states or states parties coming together uh, and start reflecting on um, the new challenges in front of us. Now, coming to the third, new vision, new approaches. Um, there are growing recognitions um, um, by, state, uh, by, by member states that there is a need, need for a new vision uh, for disarmament, uh, arms control, and non-proliferation. And the fact that the, there are diverse um, groups of uh, member states are now taking or starting to take initiatives to reflect uh, upon those issues. Um, I actually put as, a, uh, as one of the first examples the creating environment for nuclear disarmament led by uh, the United States is uh, um, precisely because of such uh, recognition that there are issues that you need to reflect upon. But there are also other initiatives, the German-French initiatives, uh, artificial intelligence, the missiles, etc. cetera. Um, it is, in fact, encouraging that a number of countries are actually coming together and create processes so they can share views uh, and exchange uh, their reflections on these. Um, these uh, initiatives, in our view, should be really an opportunity to preserve and also consolidate the gains made to date, uh, but also consider new realities of the 21st century. Um, and aware of um, such thinking that um, this would not be developed overnight, it will take some time for us to in fact uh, uh, come to some elements of uh, new uh, approaches. Um, because they are um, outstanding variables and questions to address. Um, for us, um, they, they are some principles uh, which we would like to see in, in many of those uh, reflection processes. And let me just say uh, five very uh, quickly. Um, the first one, we think these uh, reflections really need to be uh, based on the norms of non-use of non nuclear weapons. Uh, and really reaffirming the goal of their total elimination. Second, uh, we also believe that we need to adhere to key principles like um, ver verifiability, irreversibility, and transparency, and also accountability um, and enforcement. Uh, this really has to cut across all of the um, arms control and disarmament measures. A third, um, <coughs> is that um, we think we should place disarmament within the broader sp scope of our international security work, including on conflict prevention and peace building. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in all of those discussions, disarmament discussions cannot take place in isolation. Uh, it cannot stay in the silo, but we need to make sure that it will be at the core uh, of the, uh, the security discussions. Um, the fourth is um, the emphasis on good faith uh, dialogue and negotiations, which at, at the moment uh, we, don't, um, we don't see, very unfortunately. Um, the first step will be probably to take stock of, of our existing toolkits uh, and to make sure that it, fits for it, it will fit for purpose um, and it, it is also filling the gap that we see um, uh, in the international environment. 
we also need to develop a common understanding of, of new risks. Um, and, and that will take also a, a lot of uh, creative thinkings as well. We face their interaction and, and, and with uh, existing concerns. There are a lot of di separate discussions taking place in cyber, in AI, outer space, etc. In New York, there is still a, a discussion taking place this week in the group of governmental experts on cyber security issues. Uh, we need to also bring those things together so that we can actually look at them um, uh, all together in a holistic manner. And then also um, we need an honest debate about um, how international law applies in some of those new areas. Again, um, I always say that law applies. Um, we cannot say that there is nothing and there is a, a wild <coughs> west out there, but we need to uh, also be honest uh, and, and reflect whether gaps exist in international law or not. And then fifth, very strongly uh, from the United Nations point of view, um, any new reflection uh, process will have to in enhance and strengthen protection of civilians. Um, that will be quite an important point for us. Now, what should these discussions, in fact, cover, if you will, uh, if you will the scope of such uh, reflection processes? And there are several also. Um, maybe uh, six or seven, uh, very quickly. Uh, we think that we should uh, encompass all kinds of nuclear weapons and, and qualitative developments, not just the numbers, but also the qualities of uh, weapons. Second, uh, we think we should highlight risks posed by especially dangerous weapons. Uh, some of them are quite new, hypersonic weapons, God forbid, nuclear armed drones, uh, weapons designed to attack civilian infrastructures, etc. Uh, those really uh, needs to be uh, uh, um, thought, th thought through. The third, uh, strengthen regional approaches for disarmament, including through the developments of uh, more um, 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 confidence building measures. Uh, what are the specific requirements in different regions uh, in order to have uh, um, those um, strengthened confidence building measures, I think will be quite important point. Fourth, um, we need to enhance transparency about new weapon uh, systems, including uh, enhanced implementation of national weapons reviews. Now we do all uh, have to um, engage more rigorously uh, weapons reviews, um, and uh, um, it, will, it will be useful for us uh, to exchange some good practices and experiences uh, of the national weapons review exercises. The sixth um, is, uh, sorry, the fifth is the um, uh, long overdue issue of missiles. Now, there are some new initiatives starting. Uh, I think it's very important. Um, the primary de delivery uh, vehicles for nuclear weapons, and this is a difficult area because we don't have a global uh, a universal uh, standard, uh, but this is definitely impacting uh, all of our discussions on the strategic uh, uh, issues, and therefore this features very strongly. And the sixth, related very much to the missiles issues, is somehow we need to also reflect on the issue of anti-missile system, especially ballistic missile defense, precisely because the fears about the future deployments runs deep, and it, it, also, it is also impacting uh, the rhetorics uh, and uh, exchanges about how these uh, systems really need to be uh, uh, deployed and developed, and, and that also becomes one of the proliferation drivers in our view. Um, and then the, the seventh, um, is um, we think we should seek to address the concurrent promise and challenges of new technologies, especially cyber and AI. Uh, these are, in fact, uh, very much um, uh, related to strategic stability. Um, what, uh, against this background of new technologies, what should the strategic stability look like in a new um, uh, era that links up with, of course, the nuclear, nuclear weapons as well? Um, and finally, um, I would need to um, and emphasize this from the United Nations point of view, uh, we have to recognize and address in all of those areas gendered impact 
of different weapons types and, and systems uh, without those gendered impacts uh, taken into account in the 21st century. It will not be a comprehensive uh, discussions on how arms control and, and disarmament should look like. So um, obviously many of those issues will, will have to be led by um, nuclear weapon states and, and obviously the largest, two largest uh, nuclear weapon uh, states, uh, US and Russia. But this is in fact an area where all member states need to take respective uh, uh, responsibilities. Um, which means that while the, 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 the most important strategic agreements will still need to be formed and discussed by uh, nuclear weapon states, there are others who will need to also step in, and therefore the importance of multilateral solutions and multilateral discussions. And this brings me to my concluding part, uh, which is about revitalizing multilateral uh, discussions on those issues. Um, the next year will be the 75th of many. Well, first of all, the 50th anniversary of the NPT, a very important multilateral, I would say almost universal multilateral uh, um, security pillar agreement. But also it's the 75th of uh, United, at the end of World War II, uh, 75th of the anniversary um, um, uh, events will be taking place at the United Nations, uh, create, founding of the United Nations, the theme of that is the multilateralism and how we can uh, revitalize and in fact to reflect, reflect upon what, what kind of multilateralism that we need in the 21st century. The Secretary General has highlighted a need for perhaps um, networked multilateralism. Uh, what that means, I think, is that we need to, the United Nations also need to work with other multilateral platforms, the regional organizations, case in point. Um, one of the, um, the commitments that we made in the Secretary General's agenda for disarmament is that we would like to have a strengthened policy dialogue between the United Nations and regional organizations. Um, so I am very uh, keen to, to develop common understandings and common understandings especially on what are the respective roles that we can play from the UN, from different regional organizations uh, in these areas of uh, disarmament and arms control. But also we need to capture and, and involve more diverse uh, actors in those discussions. Uh, the younger people, in fact, taking uh, ownership on those security discussions will be quite important. Uh, more women are empowered um, as part of the negotiating uh, forces within those. Uh, but also uh, private sector, civil society, industry people, especially in the area of technology and how these technologies are, in fact, impacting our security collectively. So effective multi-stakeholder platforms will be important. And, and if I could just say that um, multi-stakeholder platform that we organized just last week uh, on cybersecurity issues, uh, there was such a, a positive atmosphere that was created, not just from the, the industry, private sector, and civil society people, but also the member states who were uh, present in those discussions. They thought that it was a very useful a discussion that they had. They learned uh, how those uh, communities are looking at security issues, and, and we thought it was a very important uh, development that we achieved at the United Nations in this regard. So a uh, broad spectrum of uh, actors uh, joining in in the multilateral discussions. Of course, the security is a prerogative uh, of governments. Um, so I will actually uh, put it like this, that the governments will have to take primary responsibility to discuss and, 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 and reflect upon what kind of security that we want to make in the 21st century, but they can be informed and they can benefit from the inputs uh, coming from other actors as well. European Union, in all of this, as I mentioned, um, you're the largest supporter of the Secretary General's agenda, um, but you are also uh, one of the strongest supporters of uh, multilateralism. Um, so we see European Union as an indispensable partner, and we welcome uh, your um, uh, inputs and, and continued support, and we would like to continue to work very closely in these areas. 
including uh, in the MPT review conference. Uh, I hope that you will help um, to achieve united political support uh, for the MPT review conference. Uh, and we, all, we also hope that you will engage very actively in the development of a, a new vision or new approaches uh, going forward. Uh, and um, as I always emphasize, the United Nations uh, is a supporter in all of this. Uh, we do not dictate, even if we want to dictate, we cannot. Uh, we are the, the entity um, that, is create, that was created uh, 75 years ago, almost 75 years ago, as an instrument to support member states, but we would like to be and we strive to be a useful uh, instrument in, in all of those. So we're very much looking forward to um, uh, um, these uh, new dis discussions and, and I think it is, while it is extremely challenging, it is an exciting uh, a process that we all need to engage in. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I must say it's uh, quite a, a substantive and extremely broad-ranging uh, beginning of our discussions, of the debate. Thank you very much uh, for this. Obviously, selfishly, um, I'm sure uh, my colleagues will be tweeting uh, the one sentence which you repeated, which is that the EU is now the biggest supporter and champion of actions <laughs> under the UNSG's disarmament agenda. Uh, but obviously, um, the points you have made are a major contribution uh, to the discussion uh, in this conference, which will be taking place around this uh, impressive table, but also during the, the breaks. Um, I'm now moving uh, the floor to uh, our visitor from Washington. Uh, Dr. Ford has been a participant in this conference, I think, for many years, with uh, just changing title to a progressively <laughs> higher level uh, speaker uh, from the U.S. Uh, you have the floor, Kirsten. Uh, thank you very much, Yasak. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here once again, and, and thank you to the organizers for putting this uh, extraordinary event together, and, and thank you for, for you, uh, to you for chairing our panel here today. Um, rather than give you all the, the, the usual sort of conference event uh, rundown of talking points and policy exhortations, I thought that I would take the opportunity today to talk a little bit about some bigger picture conceptual themes in the, the world of arms control. Uh, because they are very relevant to, uh, frankly, to many of the issues that uh, uh, Izumi mentioned a moment ago. Um, in particular, I would like to explore the distinctive roles and characteristics of two very different modes of arms control discourse. Uh, one approach is a much more traditional way of thinking about controlling the risks of potentially dangerous technologies, while the other is less traditional but is nonetheless one that has been developing by leaps and bounds in recent years as the international community has struggled with rapid and portentous changes in the technological environment. Um, so the, the first of these two discourses is what I think of as the, the traditional approach. Um, this is uh, principally prohibitory and regulatory. It aspires to work on the basis of bright line distinctions uh, and categories. Binary oppositions such as uh, legal versus illegal, compliance versus non-compliance, and that sort of thing. And it can generally be thought of as a system of, uh, at least aspirationally, hard rules with the air quotes. Uh, most of us are familiar with this discourse uh, because it's the usual one that one sees in, uh, in the arms control arena when it comes to uh, things such as uh, uh, New START or INF or whatever it may, it may be. So let's call this the, the, the regulatory or legal regulatory approach. Uh, but the second discourse, the one I'd like to spend most of my time on, is more of a fluid, uh, more of a socially constituted approach. It seeks to establish and maintain norms <coughs> and standards of responsible behavior. It's more about setting collective expectations than it is about imposing rigid prohibitions, more about eliciting agreement upon and encouraging congruence with behavioral guidelines than about flatly prohibiting or outlawing something and more concerned with the effects of specific behavioral choices uh, about what to do with potentially problematic things than about those things themselves. Uh, let's call this one the normative discourse. Uh, these approaches are not exactly polar opposites or antitheses, but they are different enough, I think, uh, to, to make it useful to think of them analytically separate, separately, and I think comparing them is useful. Now, as I indicated, most of us are quite familiar with the traditional legal regulatory approach. But most non-experts, I would think, are perhaps less familiar with how important the other discourse is, 
the normative approach. Um, yet there are multiple examples in the world today of how countries are, as we speak, working together to develop, articulate, and encourage behavior that is consistent with frameworks of responsible state behavior. Uh, and this takes a somewhat different approach than that traditional model. One of these areas in which there is ongoing normative development is cyberspace. No one here today, of course, needs me to tell them about the ways in which cyberspace ties us all together in unprecedented ways and provides ways to enrich uh, the lives of all humanity. Nor do you need me to emphasize how, for that very same reason, malicious activity in cyberspace has the potential to cause untold chaos. And yet, of course, in this arena, malicious activity is a day-to-day -day thing. Some states have tried, in response to these challenges, to promote burdensome regulatory approaches to arms control in cyberspace, although not all of these proposals have been made, I think, with good intentions. I myself have been warning for some time about the danger that uh, there might be efforts to subject cyberspace to a regulatory-style framework uh, on the basis of skewed understandings that threaten to turn cyber arms control into a tool with which authoritarian governments could use international instruments to suppress freedom of speech and expression, particularly freedom of speech and expression critical of those regimes. But thankfully, efforts have been underway for some years to develop an alternative way to try to deal with cyber challenges that I think is, uh, is, is very interesting and, and promising. Uh, it's important to have such an alternative because traditional approaches to arms control in many respects make very little sense in the cyber arena. And not merely because cyber weapons, if you may call them that, exist in private sector and non-state actor hands as well as in state hands. And also because of the fast moving and uh, uh, physical, the fast moving nature and the physical insubstantiality of the technologies in question. So far, no one has yet to propose an effective way in which traditional approaches to arms control could fully handle cyber weapons. Cyber weapons, after all, consist merely of software. They can be held as easily in state as in non-state hands, and they are carefully concealed rather than displayed in parades, for example, uh, carefully concealed prior to deployment in order to protect coding secrets and target vulnerabilities. They can be created, replicated, stored, or transmitted almost anywhere by anyone and at any time, and the pace of innovation in the cyber arena is such that any negotiated agreement that approaches in the traditional fashion trying to control specific cyber tools is bound to be obsolete before the ink is even dry. And of course, how would you even verify compliance with such a thing, even if you could articulate principles under which it would work? Clearly, traditional regulatory arms control is not going to be much use in cyberspace. But, and here's the important piece, it does not mean, all of this does not mean that one can do nothing about it. And indeed, some years ago, the United States began working very closely with a variety of thoughtful friends and partners, including EU member states, to build normative answers to this challenge. Now, this work is still underway, but considerable progress has been made in spelling out meaningful standards of responsible behavior in cyberspace. One extremely important understanding that has been articulated in recent years, uh, and to which uh, Azumi alluded, is the idea that international law, including international humanitarian law and international human rights law, applies to state behavior in cyberspace. An important degree of international agreement on this point came in 2013 in a UNGGE report. This conclusion was reiterated in a subsequent GGE report in 2015, and both of those reports have been endorsed by UN member states. Now, the cyber arena may be a strange and new battle space, but at least where cyber operations are used in situations of armed conflict, there is now international understanding that a state's cyber forces must conform their actions to longstanding legal principles, humanity, necessity, proportionality, and distinction. Use of cyber weapons, in other words, is being recognized as having the potential to amount to real war with all of the legal and moral obligations that come with undertaking the grave responsibilities of taking up arms. But that's not all, because of course, the armed conflict is not the only scenario about which one worries. Fortunately, progress is also being made today in developing non-binding norms of responsible state behavior that apply short of armed conflict. In June of 2015, for instance, GGE issued a report making recommendations for voluntary non-binding rules, norms, and principles of responsible behavior aimed at promoting an open, secure, stable, accessible, and peaceful cyber arena in the peacetime context 
as well. That GGE's report was adopted by consensus and it was subsequently welcomed by consensus in the entire UN General Assembly. Such setting out of sensible principles for operations in both wartime and peacetime cyber contexts represent a very significant step forward in helping create international expectations through articulating common ideas of responsible cyber behavior, and they should just should therefore help guide countries' approach to this fast-moving technological arena. These kinds of normative understandings, I would stress, can also help anchor the policy choices of responsible states in responding to bad behavior in cyberspace, which is, of course, what normative regimes do by way of compliance enforcement. Like-minded nations need to continue to seek global affirmation of this framework of responsible state behavior in cyberspace and must also advance capabilities to cooperatively respond to bad behavior when it does occur. So cyberspace has been an important area of normative innovation in this second discourse that I was referring to. But it's not the only one. We are also working to explore how to use such approaches to cope with challenges from potential malicious conduct in outer space, a domain that is also critical to national security, global communications, and to commerce. Unfortunately, a range of threats to, space, to the space domain are growing, with certain countries having now made space into a warfighting domain, China and Russia specifically. Yet the nature of space as a new arena for conflict, the dual-use nature of most space technology, and the extreme technical difficulties in developing effective verification regimes also make this a very challenging place to try to apply traditional arms control models. Nevertheless, normative development in space is promising and is underway, and we've been in recent years joined by counterparts from around the world in seeking to promote a framework of responsible behavior in outer space, including such things as promoting the explicit recognition that international law, including international humanitarian law, does apply in that domain as well. We are also encouraging transparency and confidence building measures, multilaterally and bilaterally, as recommended in a 2013 consensus report of a UNGGE. And there are other areas where normative work is also underway. In the uh, era, uh, area of, uh, of bioscience, for example, where risk and threat-focused consciousness raising and the promulgation of best practices is especially important in outreach to private industry, the medical profession, the academic and research communities, and as a result of the pervasiveness of bioscience tools and capabilities. Uh, this is a normative challenge for everyone, and it is also underway. With respect to controlling the spread of potential WMD delivery systems, both the MTCR and the Hague Code of Conduct on Missile Proliferation could also be regarded as evolving normative systems. These have, I think, great potential to shape state behavior and have already done so in some very important ways. Another thing to mention, since this is flagged often as an area of uh, technology concern, uh, it's also worth noting that there are normatively focused discussions presently underway between a number of key countries aimed at articulating understandings of best practice guidelines pertaining to the use of conventionally armed drones. Now, it's not entirely clear how to take those technologies under the wing of traditional arms control approaches, but we are in fact working with counterparts to develop normative answers to some of these challenges that apply to the world of armed unmanned aerial systems. This is also a very promising area. So if you count the normative communities that are being, that have been built up in uh, uh, like-minded partners, in, in, such as the, the NSG, the Proliferation Security Initiative, the Australia Group, the Bosnar Arrangement, the Nuclear Security Contact Group, it may in fact be that normative communities of normative arms control uh, effort uh, are perhaps in some ways more common than traditional arms control approaches in the world today. So I do think it is very important to take them seriously and to understand their distinctive characteristics. I would argue that the applicability of each of these two paradigms, the traditional regulatory approach and the more normative one, uh, is how well they apply and when the, each of those apply is bound up with our sense of international community or our degree of lack of it. If you were to imagine a continuum that runs, a continuum of community, if you will, that runs on the one hand from kind of a Hobbesian anarchy on, on, on one side of the, the continuum to a, an almost a familial relationship on the other, these approaches would be differentially useful at different places along that continuum. Traditional regulatory arms control could be thought of as sitting more towards the sort of harsher end uh, where there is less community and harder rules and punishments and uh, criteria are thought to be necessary, while the normative approach would perhaps be toward the other end of the con community continuum. 
normative approach uh, standards are they're fuzzier, to be sure, uh, than the sharp, bright line regulatory or prohibitory dictates of traditional arms control, but they are rooted more in the participants' sense of self in community. Normative regimes require more judgment and good faith in application, and they rely more upon like-mindedness and shared values linked to a sense of collective identity. In effect, they proclaim that this is what responsible players do, and we, the participants, recognize each other as responsible players. And these types of approaches do not lack for compliance enforcement, although it takes a somewhat different form than one is usually uh, thinking of. When a community has developed a compelling sense of responsible behavior, and its participants have tied their own sense of self in some way to these standards, it can exert important compliance pressure when someone slips out of the realm of mere error or disagreement or lapse into what is clearly willfully antisocial behavior. In those kinds of circumstances, as we all know in our daily lives, community pressures can in fact be quite important and powerful, and this can be true in the international arena as well. So this is all a very promising area, and it is perhaps in some ways the most interesting uh, type of development in the arms control world right now from a conceptual perspective, and it is trying to address some very, very thorny issues indeed as we move forward. So to conclude, let me stress that U.S. diplomats and interagency partners have been key drivers in developing, and continue to be key drivers in developing this, this, these effective normative approaches and to build normative communities to help cope with the security implications of some very potentially transformative technologies and, its, and their evolution in the world. We seek to develop and build upon like-mindedness in these arenas with a wide range of partners willing to engage with us in good faith in trying to manage these challenges. We also seek to use this like-mindedness as a foundation for collective action in response to reckless or destabilizing behaviors should they occur. But this is not to say that we have given up on traditional arms control either. We continue to prize and to pursue more traditional regulatory type approaches to arms control wherever they can advance U.S. allied and partner security and where we feel that we can have confidence that agreements are verifiable and enforceable and include partners who will comply responsibly with their obligations. We remain committed to this despite chronic violations of arms control agreements by the Russian Federation, which unfortunately has so tragically led to the demise of the INF Treaty. All in all, you will find the United States a good friend of arms control and an opponent of bad arms control, an attitude which we are now bringing to developing a future for arms control in response to the destabilizing expansion of Russian and Chinese nuclear capabilities, which threaten to precipitate a new worldwide nuclear arms race. As our President has made very clear, it is vital that nuclear arms control adapt itself to the modern strategic environment. We are committed to an approach that involves both Russia and China in order to forestall that arms race by negotiating a trilateral nuclear arms control agreement, thus giving humanity breathing space in which to try to construct a better future. This is no small task. It will take time and effort and commitment, and we urge all of you to help us in this endeavor, and we urge all of you to work with us and to continue to build forward the, the other discourse of arms control as well as we try to find normative answers to some of the thorniest challenges and conceptual conundra that confront the arms control community. Thank you for listening and for having me here at this conference. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. I must admit that uh, my tongue is itching to enter into a discussion uh, to, um, uh, on, on this conceptual uh, approach uh, and ask a question whether what you are promoting as this new approach is not really a step back or uh, from, from the traditional uh, regulatory and prohibitory approach or at least uh, maybe an intermediate measure or a, uh, only a stepping stone towards uh, the, the, the more traditional, more strict approach. But this uh, I will leave to, uh, to, the, um, to the participants uh, trying not to abuse the position of the chair, but rather now I would move the floor to our uh, Russian participant, uh, senior participant from the uh, Russian diplomatic service uh, and uh, very richly experienced in all fields of arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation. Uh, Ambassador Ulyanov, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, I would like to express thanks uh, to the organizers of this conference for inviting me. I believe uh, the presence of uh, a Russian official here 
uh, may be helpful in order to ensure a, comp a more comprehensive picture of the station, not uh, one-sided approach. <coughs> you know, uh, I uh, uh, have communicated with American partners, diplomats in the field of uh, multilateral diplomacy since the end of 80s. And I can tell you that never ever the U.S. diplomacy has been so much ideologized. It even refers to something like witch hunt, uh, elements of macrotism, etc. This is extremely regrettable because on this base, on such basis, we cannot develop <coughs> fruitful and uh, <coughs> pragmatic cooperation. <coughs> <clears throat> uh, I must tell you also that, uh, frankly, uh, Mr. Ford disappointed me very much <clears throat> because this time, on a very rare occasion, he refrained from expressing uh, harsh anti-Russian sentiments. I was ready to reciprocate, but he deprived me of uh, such an opportunity. <laughs> very regrettable. Actually, <clears throat> my American counterpart represented uh, a new ideological platform, traditional legal approach versus uh, an innovative normative approach. Yatsak, you asked if it is not a step back. No, you are not right. It's two or three or five steps back from what we have. It's obvious that uh, <clears throat> uh, Washington doesn't like international law. Uh, it uh, was not occasional that instead talking of international law, uh, world uh, order based on international law, American an analysts invented something new, rules-based world order. You know, uh, legal basis is something, something more solid than vague norms and rules, especially in view of the fact that we don't understand who is going to invent these rules, who will monitor compliance with them. Apparently, Washington. <clears throat> uh, and uh, this line of action, this uh, mindset, has already led to elimination of a number vital, of vital uh, arms control agreements, starting with uh, uh, the ABM Treaty in the beginning of the, this century. Uh, then, uh, multilateral negotiations on a protocol to biological weapons conventions uh, were blocked and under undermined. Non-fulfillment of Istanbul commitments by the United States led to disappearance of conventional arms control in Europe. We were compelled to introduce mon moratorium on uh, uh, CFA treaty. Now we observed recently the failure, uh, demise of INF Treaty. Uh, I have a different view on how it, how it could happen. Uh, from my perspective, from the Russian perspective, uh, the American side came to the conclusion that uh, INF is something like straight jacket for the US policy. Uh, straight jacket which prevents uh, projection of force in different uh, regions of the world. And they have started to undermine this treaty step by step using a smoke screen and blaming Russia for alleged violations of the treaty. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that never ever the American side was, ed was able, able to pre present any evidence of the so-called Russian violations. At the same time, Washington <coughs> continued preparations for withdrawal, and it was not occasional that just two weeks after the US, U.S. withdrawal, on the 18th of August, the U.S. conducted a flight test of a prototype of uh, INF range missile. So preparations were underway for a long time, for many years, uh, and resulted in uh, the ruining of uh, one of the most important instruments ensuring European and world security. Extremely regrettable. 
I must also say a few words about uh, JCPOA, because in my current capacity, I'm responsible for this matter in Vienna. Actually, JCPOA was a masterpiece of diplomacy, the only achievement of diplomatic efforts in the Middle East for many, many years. Uh, it was very fragile, but successful, and I must tell you that the U.S. contributed a lot to this diplomatic achievement. And look for yourself. Just three years ago, everything was okay. Everything was fine in the Middle East, uh, in the Persian Gulf in particular. The JCPOA was implemented smoothly. Total freedom of navigation, no military incidents. Everything was okay. Why everything is now spoiled? Due to maximum pressure policy of the United States, the answer is obvious. Of course, U.S. has the right to withdraw, as any other state. But they went even further, and they started to prevent others from implementing JCPOA through economic blackmail, uh, threats, etc. How can one country dictate to others if they should implement 2231 resolution of the UN Security Council or not? It's beyond any imagination. And these blackmails are, ext are extended to allies of the United States, leave alone other states. <coughs> Actually, it's a violation of the UN Charter, in particular, Article 25, according to which all states, including the United States, undertook to accept and carry out UN Security Council decisions. So there is a big risk that JCPOA will die soon with all the negative uh, consequences for the activities of the International Atomic Energy Agency in Iran. Judging by the position of the United States on WND free zone in the Middle East and JCPOA, I should say that uh, the US policy has become the major challenge to global nuclear non-proliferation regime, which is extremely regrettable. <clears throat> now, uh, I believe I paid too much attention to critical remarks uh, addressed to the United States some positive elements uh, regarding what to do. And I must tell you, of course, Russia is stick to international law, not to some norms and regulations. Because international law is much more solid foundation, much more solid basis for international cooperation and international security. So the first step to be taken is uh, very simple. We need to extend uh, the new START treaty. Time is running out. On the 5th of February 2021, the treaty will cease to exist. And we, not only Russia, but the United States, will uh, lost uh, transparency and predictability in the form of uh, data, data exchanges, notifications, inspections. It would be regrettable and counterproductive. Besides, we need more time to consider uh, possible elaboration of a hypothetical new agreement in the sphere of uh, strategic nuclear weapons. Mr. Ford mentioned trilateral arrangement, Russia, China, and uh, the United States. You know, from professional viewpoint, it's nonsense. When I hear, you, uh, hear that from uh, a professional, I become very much, how to put it, shocked, because uh, the approach is uh, rather strange to put it gently. U.S. forget about uh, French and U.K. nuclear arsenals, about nuclear arsenals of its uh, military allies, and singles out China as uh, a country who, who should join uh, nuclear disarmament. 
such an approach has nothing to do with real life. It has no single chance uh, to succeed. And even for the sake of public relations, you should have proposed a multilateral nuclear disarmament agreement with participation of uh, all official uh, nuclear states or maybe all official and de facto nuclear weapon states, something like that. But first step, once again, the extension of uh, the new START treaty. I hope that uh, at the conference of, uh, disarmament, on disarmament, which stays idle for more than 20 years, we also have a chance to move ahead. Russia proposed uh, to elaborate an international convention to combat acts of chemical and biological terrorism. Topical issue, topical. We have already convention on prevention of acts of uh, nuclear terrorism, but in the field of biology and uh, chemical weapons, there is an obvious gap. Besides, if such negotiations start, uh, we will save the conference uh, on disarmament, which can die very soon, because it has no work program and no real business to do. Uh, we need to do something with outer space. The prospect of weaponization of outer space is coming. Okay, if uh, Europeans do not like uh, Russian initiatives, invent, invent your own. But if weaponization of outer space take place, we will have to forget about arms control, especially uh, nuclear disarmament. It uh, would be another game changer, like ballistic missile defense, and most likely irreversible. <coughs> so we need to pay special attention to this particular aspect. Uh, North Korea, we welcomed uh, the US efforts in this area, and we wished Washington all the best in this endeavor. <coughs> but you can see for yourself, there is a total stalemate for a long time. And the reason is obvious. The United States uh, colleagues totally forgot about diplomacy. They proceed from the understanding that first North Korea should denuclearize itself totally, and then they are going to talk about possible incentives and assurances. Such an approach has no chance to succeed, and it's natural that for a long time we observe total stalemate. My country, and I'm afraid that the time is running out. North Koreans say, if you don't want to negotiate, we will uh, beat you farewell very soon. My country is going to produce and present some concrete ideas, something like action plan, which would stimulate further discussions. JCPOA, I believe the only chance to save this deal is uh, uh, French efforts, very timely and very useful, not quite successful yet. But we wish uh, our French colleagues all the best because they are doing a very great job. NPT Review Conference. Uh, I agree with those who believe that uh, we should consider the possibility of uh, a short ministerial level statement at the beginning of the conference, and then continue with a draft final document uh, along usual lines. This, uh, this is a good idea. <clears throat> and finally, the last point, or maybe two last points, uh, WMD free zone in the Middle East. Uh, I hope very much that uh, Israel uh, will reconsider its position and will join its, number, um, its neighbors in a very important dialogue. Israel is most wanted as a participant, and uh, uh, Arab countries and Iran agreed on very favorable conditions for participation based on the rule of consensus. It means that any participant in the conference, including Israel would have the right of veto, both on substantive and procedural questions. 
it would be regrettable to miss an opportunity to establish some dialogue among uh, states of the region, including Israel. Final point. This year, uh, the General Assembly approved uh, the Russian draft resolution on strengthening uh, uh, the system of uh, agreements in the field of arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. 175 states voted in favor, including the United States, to my surprise. I believe this is a very encouraging development. Um, so probably, probably it's too early to be over pessimistic. Let's try to unite our efforts in order to improve the current situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mikhail, for ending on this uh, positive note. What I should uh, note as the chair is that these two um, recent remarks, sets of remarks, are uh, a demonstration how uh, that the European Union, and in particular the EU NPD consortium is really providing a platform for dialogue on these important issues, dialogue which is very much needed. On substance, just on the INF, as this is an extremely important topic for the EU, uh, you called it a straight jacket, and in this you were uh, very much in line with uh, a statement by the president of the Russian Federation many years ago, who declared that the INF treaty was no longer uh, in uh, Russian security interests. They clearly didn't regard it as uh, much of a straight track uh, the last 10 years or so. Uh, we uh, now would like to move to the next uh, contributor to our uh, panel. And uh, we already had uh, the high representative uh, speaking through somebody, uh, somebody else's uh, voice. And uh, so we obviously do not blame the NATO Secretary General for having chosen uh, Irene Lemos Magnati, the Deputy Director of the um, Non-Proliferation Disarmament Arms Control Center, uh, for delivering the, the NATO remarks here. Irene, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Jacek, and good morning, everybody. Uh, William was supposed to be uh, delivering the the, uh, the statements, but he was uh, called in for a meeting, so I'll just step in to deliver NATO's uh, short statements in this uh, very important um, event and conference. First of all, I would like to thank you, Jacek, for inviting NATO to speak uh, at this first panel on uh, um, non-proliferation and disarmament conference. Um, I'm very happy to be here among friends, uh, as uh, Izumi mentioned also at the beginning. First of all, with you, who used to be the director of uh, the WMD Center in NATO, as you mentioned, um, and ac actually quite instrumental in enhancing the nato eu cooperation on arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation at these difficult times. You've been very much uh, at the forefront in keeping a positive momentum. Um, very glad to be next to Chris Ford, um, uh, a good friend and a, um, an important player in this important discussion, but also Izumi, uh, somebody we knew, know very well, who wor we worked ma many years together um, and, if, um, uh, and has been instrumental in the NATO-UN cooperation. So um, I'm very proud and happy to be here, but I'm also, I want to say that as a NATO official, um, I'm very proud of our recent London declaration uh, at the leaders' meeting where we stated, and I'm reading here, we are fully committed to the preservation and strengthening of effective arms control, disarm, and non-proliferation, taking into account the prevailing security environment. Allies are strongly committed to full implementation of the Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons in all its aspects including nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. And last but not least, we remain open for dialogue and to a constructive relationship with Russia when Russia's actions make that possible. Five years into the crisis, into the Ukraine crisis, I think it's remarkable that allies continue to put so much emphasis in such a brief statement on arms control on the NPT Treaty and on the dialogue with Russia. You also have heard the Secretary General the 23rd of October, he gave a first speech after many years on arms control. 
I think the last one, as we recall, was in the 1990s from since Manfred Berner. And he gave a very forward-looking vision for the future for Na of NATO and arms control for the time in 29 years. And in that speech, he stated clearly that priority is to contribute as much as we can to a successful NPT review conference in 2020. He also said we will work on risk reduction through the Vienna document on disarmament verification to include nuclear, conventional, and chemical. And we will dis examine how best to address the new and emerging disruptive technologies. These are very positive and specific steps that we can take together. But the guiding questions that you put forward to us are, um, were very helpful. You raised issues about the repeated use of chemical weapons the modernization of nuclear arsenals, proliferation of arms, uh, with the proliferation continuing and arms control agreements ending, the prospect of extending new agreements. Um, I think Jacek has posed the right questions um, and um, including on the EU-US relations. Um, as a NATO official, I'm very glad to see that the EU-US dialogue I on arms control is happening regularly and at such high levels. It really shows the shared interests we have. And at NATO, as the leader's statement and the section speech shows, we're going to do everything we can to support the global arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation regimes. Most recently, Allies fully supported the efforts to strengthen the chemical convention at the meeting of the state parties, including the widest support to include the fourth generation nerve agents, including the Novichoks, on the list of prohibited chemicals. And the vote on the permanent budget, which will accommodate continued work on, work on the investigative mechanism, a key victory in the effort to rebuild the norms against the use of chemical weapons. And while some arms control as mentioned today have ended, we have to understand why. The INF Treaty ended because of Russia's decision to violate it. Allies saw clearly that Russia was the one violating the treaty and supported the US decision. And now Russia has put forward a confusing moratorium, but we believe they should engage with the United States bilaterally to verifiably and irreversibly eliminate the entire category of these weapons. But this should not blind us to the need to address the spread of long-range missile across Asia, the Middle East, including to non-state actors, which are spreading instability. So how do we ensure the success of current agreements? As the Secretary General mentioned, we must all redouble our efforts to ensure successful 2020 NPT. It is the most urgent priority before us. Allies will work with their partners, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and our publics to find the pathways for positive outcomes. The creating the environment for nuclear disarmament approach, which seeks to address why states seek nuclear weapons, allies fully support it. Some allies are also part of the Swedish Stepping Stones approach, which similarly brings together countries of widely different views to, come to find common approaches and build bridges to success. Allies will continue to support strengthened safeguards, the additional protocols un universalization, work to support nuclear disarmament verification across the different initiatives, such as the IPNDV and the Quad, as mentioned earlier, and specific steps towards nuclear and conventional risk reduction. And I think we underplay the role the Vienna document plays in risk reduction and conflict prevention, considering the agreement covers four of the P5, and that's a pretty signif significant contribution to risk reduction. The P5's active role is very important, um, and we hope to play a more substantive, and we look that it starts playing a more substantive role than ever, and will be key to demonstrate real progress in dialogue that can lead to real progress. 
And of course, I think the change in the REFCON presidency reminds us that it's up to nations ultimately to find and compromises and positive way ahead. We cannot leave it up to others, but we must find successes ourselves. And I want to wish successes to the new presidency, the chair of the NPT, who I believe is among us, or the incoming chair. So I don't think we will see major agreements coming up, but it's precisely in this transitional period that we need to redouble our efforts to address and engage on issues pertaining to arm, the challenges to arms control and engage all actors. Um, it's high time that China begins to making steps towards transparency and more important towards restraints. We at NATO we will continue to engage to continue and examine all aspects of arms control, but also what was mentioned, um, challenges and opportunities that new technologies can offer. And while in these issues arms control are not always the solution, setting rules, codes and conducts of behavior may be the right way. We are at an important moment in the history of the NPT Treaty. Allies supported its negotiations, its entry into force, and its imp implementation in all its aspects for 50 years. We must preserve and strengthen the NPT. The NPT has delivered for us and we must work to ensure it continues to deliver into the future. And from a NATO point of view, we'll do our utmost to support a successful outcome. Thank you, Gertrude.